Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by Tommy Sheridan and Stephen Craig where we'll be talking to George Galloway. George, thank you very much for having us. It's a real pleasure, I must tell you. And, you know, we're in a library. I thought it was only right to add to that with a a wee Celtic book. I'm stunned by your generosity and the beauty of that. It is beautifully packaged and what's inside is even more beautiful. Collection of Celtic tops. Celtic strips, actually, over the ages. I'm afraid to say some of them I have seen before you were born. Uh, but it's good, it's good to have them on my shelf. Thank you very much indeed. You, you say some of them you've seen. What would have been your team growing up? Because I'm thinking, you, what would you have been, 12, before, 13? Before, before 14, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was, my maternal uh, family uh, are Irish. My grandfather was uh, a home and away Celtic man. Uh, so I I grew up a slight pool, actually, because all my mother's side of the family were Celtic supporters and all my father's were Dundee United supporters. But as they became known as the Arabs, I felt fairly comfortable at both <laughs> grounds. <laughs> I was actually present. Uh, on the day that the moniker Arabs of Dundee United was born, right. the whole pitch was covered in sand because of uh, frost. And the United team came out in white, all white strips, and they looked like Bedouin moving across the desert. There you are. Uh, so the only time I caused a problem was when Celtic were playing Dundee United. But uh, I was Celtic through and through. Uh, mother's milk and uh, all that, but it was before Jock Steen, mm. uh, so uh, nothing like what we grew used to. Uh, but uh, I lived through the the European Cup uh, triumph. Uh, I, I tell you a funny story. I lived in an Irish area uh, in Dundee, and uh, at full time, uh, when we'd won the European Cup unbelievably now looking back on it <laughs> and then uh i ran pell-mell out the front door into the street arms aloft and right up the street other doors had opened and other young boys were running up the street arms aloft it was something never repeated never to be repeated perhaps uh it was unalloyed joy, a sense of utter joy, uh, and uh, I'll never forget it. And of course, there have been many, many great sides, great teams, generation after generation, but nothing will ever quite match winning the European Cup. I spend a lot of time in Portugal, and mm. uh, in Albufera, there's uh, a Celtic bar, more than one, but there's a Celtic bar uh, which has on the roof a huge picture of Billy holding up the cup. And you can see it for miles around. It's like a landmark. Mm -hmm. And I never see it without remembering that day. And you called Erin Zyle, George? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't go into bars, so I've never been in it. I think I might have been in that There's two. Jimmy Johnson bar is right across the road from me. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, see when Celtic won that that great triumph in Lisbon, George. I've I've read it said that you know it was a shining beacon of success, not only for a football club or for young boys in Scotland, but for what the club represented and where we came from as well. Uh, can you see that state of mind of Celtic being the oppressed almost, you know, back in the day? Yet we are the kings of Europe. Yes, but before turning to that, uh, Jock said uh, that we wanted to win in such a way that neutrals everywhere would be glad that we had won. Mm-hmm. And that definitely was achieved. Definitely. There is nobody other than the hardcore Mil- Milan fans that wanted them to win with their negative, brutal uh, style of football, which was quite common in Italy at that time. Uh, whereas we played this free-flowing, attacking football, unpredictable, always moving forward, and every neutral in the world wanted us to win purely on football grounds. But when you factor in the point you've just made uh, of Celtic's history, I mean, we we grew up, many of us, 
not going to assume anything about anybody's religion, but we grew up being called Fenian bastards every day. We never felt that we were accepted in Scotland. It's one of the reasons why I never liked the SNP, because when I grew up, the SNP were led by people that stood at the border telling the Pope's envoy he wasn't welcome in Scotland. Uh, there was uh, an atmosphere in the time I grew up in which we were really outsiders, a bit like Muslims must feel today mm -hmm. uh, in, in many senses, uh, although even more crazy because you couldn't tell one from the other. They, oh, they had square heads, we knew that, but they, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you, <laughs> you were not visibly a minority, but everybody knew who you were, what you well, uh, so that was just our experience. When the club was formed, of course, the Irish Catholic minority in Scotland were even more desperately poor than the uh, indigenous Scottish working class. And just like down in Alabama or Mississippi, uh, uh, the people who had virtually nothing looked down on the people who had actually nothing. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, revolutionary is not too uh, strong a word, I don't think. We were, we were a revolutionary presence. We were uh, the outsiders, the underdogs, whatever you want to call it. And that never really left us. Now that we're kings and always kings, it's a bit hard sometimes to remember that. You could begin to feel sorry for Rangers. Feeling too far, George. I've always been right. I've always in, engaged in hyperbole. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the truth is, it's hard now to remember, especially for younger generations, that we were the real underdogs, the downtrodden, looked down upon, despised as not, yeah. Uh, too strong a word. I mean, there were tracts being written in the Church of Scotland from within it in the 1920s that talked of us in basically subhuman uh, terms. We were an infestation somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Glasgow is green. Uh, Scottish football is green. You don't even necessarily have to look at the table now to know who's at the top of it. These are great times uh, for us and not so great for our uh, great adversaries. Um, but back then, and including in the, in the great triumph, uh, we, we were the underdogs. But we also deserved to win because of how we played football, yeah. and everyone recognised that. Yeah, without a doubt. And that's going to lead into a conversation today, especially when I've got someone like Tommy to my left, where politics and football is discussed. But just touching on um, some of your own literature, you decided uh, during your life to write a book on Neil Lennon. Mm. Why, why Neil? Of all the, the characters you've seen representing this great club, why Neil? It was at the very moment when I saw a, a Hearts fan, about which more in a, in a minute, but a Hearts fan run across the, the park to assault him in the dugout. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then get cleared of racially aggravated, religiously aggravated assault, the one which had been seen by everybody on TV. Um, it was at that moment, because uh, I'm not a great fan of Neil Lennon as a player, uh, or as a manager, I'll be frank, and I don't really know him as a man, but I, kn I know what he represented, and he represented us. Mm -hmm. He was hated for the reasons that we are hated. You see, Neil Lennon was not the kind of Irish Catholic who lowered his gaze uh, and uh, kept his mouth shut when uh, his betters were speaking. He was proud of what he was and showed it, uh, and uh, sometimes aggressively so, but more often. Uh, in the book, I call it a year of living dangerously. And it was, he was getting bullets in the post. Mm -hmm. He was having threats painted on the road outside his house. And then he was uh, assaulted uh, on television. And the guy was cleared uh, of the religiously aggravated aspect of it. Even though everybody who was there 
Herdom being described as a Fenian bastard by the guy that clocked him. Mm -hmm. I said I'd come back. The most sectarian episode of my entire life, now a long one, uh, was at Tancasa. In the run-up to the Iraq War, I was sat with uh, Alex Mawson, former Lord Provost of Glasgow and a good friend of mine, and Tosh McKinley's father. And we were sat, and we were spotted by guys down below who then spent the next 90 minutes scarcely glancing at the football, but chanting foul, vicious, sectarian abuse at me, which was funny for the first five, ten minutes, but frankly disturbing uh, after that, because I thought if I, if I were to fall down there or they were to somehow climb up here, mm -hmm. I would literally be killed by these people. I'd be lynched. It was like a lynch mob. So the worst sectarian abuse I've ever had was not from Rangers supporters, but Hearts supporters. And I always tell that story every time someone tells me they're a Hearts supporter, especially Alex Salmon. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, these, the situation uh, then, of course, I had, wasn't just a, a Fenian bastard. I was Saddam's uh, agent and Every other name you could uh, you, you you could come up with. Uh, I'm sorry. Where did I uh, start there? What were we talking? We about? We were talking about Lenny's abuse at Tin Lenny, Castle. Yeah, Lenny, to me, was emblematic of people like Tommy, like me, that see it the way they see it mm -hmm. and don't consider themselves second class to anybody, and that's why they hated him. There have been other Celtic managers that were not hated, other Irish Catholic Celtic managers that weren't hated. But Lennon was hated, and because he was hated, I wrote the book. Yeah. And you can sold out, by the way. You cannot get that. You can, you can find it ever. Do you have a one wee copy for me? Because I was the man that was with him um, one night after we had uh, played Rangers and we were having a couple of beers. They said, I'm going up the road. And I said, I'm staying, because I'm quite like her over there. And as I walked out <laughs> down, down, down a certain Ashton Lane, oh, yes. he was on the ground having hit from the back by two Rangers supporters, and he was swallowing his tongue. And I'm, I'm still a great friend of to this day, and he's such a wonderful, intelligent human being. But I'm glad to say I was a man that phoned the ambulance, and when the ambulance came, the ambulance helped us hugely. But when the police came, the same exact situation, George has just described, was so evident in the way that they approached the situation. And I had, a, I had a go and then I thought, you know what, I'm too good looking to actually go to go with you guys to Pitt Street. <laughs> but what was certain is that every part of the establishment was a hatred yeah. for who and what we are. You know, talking about Lenny. What a story. I, I mean, who could talk about that story? Yeah, I was aware, unaware of that. Uh, during the, the dark days of COVID, Tommy, you and I had a, a right good debate about should he stay or should he go, mm -hmm. remember? Mm -hmm. And you've always been a massive supporter of Neil Lennon, haven't you? Yeah, big, big supporter of Neil. Um, I, I consider him a friend. Um, Neil, in 2008, uh, I, I was searching for guests on a talk show, a Glasgow Comedy Festival um, talk show. And I'd earlier befriended uh, Martin Rayley, uh, Neil's agent. Uh, Martin had invited me to play football at the New Wembley in a charity game uh, challenge against English celebrities, so Scots celebs against English celebs. We've discussed it already. What was we, the score against? We said, well, we won that. <laughs> we won that first game. Two, did you get to? Two, well, I never scored. Martin <laughs> Comston and uh, Darren Jackson scored, but we won. We won two one. It was a, a great victory. Um, so I, I called uh, Martin. I says, Martin, now I've got this. We uh, show on at the Tron. It's only two nights. Uh, I've got uh, Jerry Conlon and Paddy Hill uh, are booked for the Friday night. So I, I, I've got two fantastic guests. Uh, Jerry and I became friends. Interviewed him in my, my radio show and things. And he was a lovely, lovely man. I says, but Saturday night, struggling for a guest. Would Neil come on? And uh, Martin says, give me an hour, Tommy. Give me an hour. And I thought, ah, he'll no, he'll no phone back. And to his word, within the other phone back, he said, Neil would love to do it. He would love it. And I said, oh, well, that's great. So this was about the Tuesday of the week. 
And when we got to the, the Friday, I got another phone call from Martin. And he says, Tommy, uh, he was playing with uh, is it Morecambe at this time. He'd left Celtic, put him in Morecambe. He says, Tommy, they're, they're playing such and such a team who don't have an airport. And I thought to myself, this is a, you know, this, you know, words, he's going to let me down lightly here. He can't make it. And I said, all right, so can, can Neil no make it? He says, no, 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 he'll make it. He'll just be slightly later. I'm going down to pick him up and we're, dri and we're driving up to the Tron. Now, there's no, there's no fee. There's no, not, not, nothing involved here. Neil's not getting anything out of being associated with me because obviously by this time I'm getting charged and all the rest of it. So, but like, George is one of the guys, he's never, ever let me do any time. I was looking for support. People talk about George and I disagreeing on politics like independence. Never, ever interfered with a friendship because mm -hmm. this man's always stuck by me. And, I, and hopefully he knows that I've stuck by him as well. Sure, sure. But he's never stopped, okay, ne never failed to stick by me. Neil came that night. He drove all the way up for, for his football game. He was a fantastic guest. And I've got to lay one claim to fame. And that is that was the first time ever when I said to him, so Neil, what are your plans? What? And he said, Tommy, I want to manage Celtic. And oh, the, 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 the supporters at the yep. time, they all yep. applauded. And he went on to he, he managed Celtic. And I've never forgot that, to Paul John. So see in the days when, see, I, I, I loved what George was saying earlier about when you were, um, an early fan and what all the glories you'd seen mm. but you also seen the tough times with Celtic and George so, see for some of the younger fans mm. they don't know they're living no. and see during that 2020 Covid year mm. I felt our fans had almost became the chauvinistic type of fans that uh, we uh, have a laugh at across the city because there was a sense of entitlement yeah. you know well oh, how how dare our team be getting beat how dare we not win the league and everything that could go wrong went wrong that season. Neil got the blame. And fair do, some people think he was more to blame than others. I don't. I think it was a combination of circumstances. For instance, we've discussed it before. When you come up to a season, George, I remember looking at the team. We'd got Ellen Ussie back. Mm -hmm. We'd signed Ayeti, who was this £5 million centre forward. Shane Duffy, I remember saying it myself, big Shane Duffy. We'd signed the Greek number one goalkeeper. I thought, we're going to win the 10. Mm. And the fact that we didn't, I don't think is down to Neil. So I've always defended him. Uh, he wasn't always everybody's favourite player or manager, but as a person, I defend him. Mm -hmm. No, you have. You've done it. Um, and you've done it with passion as well, Tommy. I mean, you guys have seen Celtic winning nearly nine in a row twice. Mm -hmm. um, and we're I in a... Believe in it. I know. In a row it's, twice. it's incredible. That's how old we are. Uh, you know? <laughs> and I might I might see it twice. You guys might see it three times. I mean, we're in a, a, a period of domination. Sure. Uh, George. But where does Celtic go from here? Should we keep one eye on the glory years of the European endeavours that you, you grew up with? Well, that's the 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 most fundamental difference between today and back then is that we performed so miserably in the Champions League. Uh, and I'm not sure how we're going to get out of that, given the current structure of Scottish football. I suspect I have a difference with Tommy on this, and maybe with all of you. Uh, but I, uh, when uh, uh, the, uh, who was that big stumer that was the Scottish Secretary of State? Jim Murphy. Uh, when, uh, Way about your mouth, Jim. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> no he's a man that... Uh, <laughs> We wouldn't agree on much. With, but Brent, he is a Celtic supporter. Yes, but he is a Celtic supporter. And so I used to lobby him uh, when he was in the government. I think that we will not kick on unless we are part of a British league. Uh, I think this current situation where we win the league every year, where even uh, a Rangers game, I mean, I tuned in last weekend uh, not expecting for one minute not to defeat them. Whereas in the past, we'd have been maybe a bit nervous and it never occurred to me that we were not going to beat them. And handsomely, again, we did. Uh, but that's it. For me, that's the season now. Uh, I can muster a great deal of interest in, in Celtic versus Ross County. Uh, I, I, I simply can't. Now, I'm lucky that I also, since 1963, the day that Dennis Law signed, 
a supporter of Manchester United, and one of my three sons may very well end up playing for them. Hopefully all of them, but at least one of them at the moment in uh, in that orbit. Uh, and so I find myself paying far more attention to the English Premiership than I can muster for the Scottish uh, Premiership. Ooh. I'm sorry if that sounds bad and people don't like it, but it's the honest truth. Uh, so, of course, I look for the result every week. But if you offered me a ticket to go and watch some of these lesser games, although one of my sons is going uh, this weekend, uh, I'd have to have nothing on. George, can I give you a count? Can I give you a wee counterpoint to that? Now? Yeah. I, I think the this is symptomatic of the board that we have, the ownership structure that we have. And, and, and by the way, I also always congratulate Peter on his financial stewardship. However, if, if, if I'm chief executive of that business, and I've been chief executive of many businesses, I would want to be, and I've said this many times, I want a Lisbon in our lifetime. And if that's not, if that's not our goal... Yeah then the stewardship of, of Celtic has to change. Because I I would rather watch Ross County versus Celtic Reserves than watch Man United. But that's only because I... I, I Over oh, the last couple uh, of years. Yeah, I, 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 it, it, it depends. It, 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 dep it depends on many things. But I fundamentally think it's not about the, 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 the fact that it gets boring. And it, it's not getting boring. It'll never get boring to beat them home and away. What, 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 what is, is getting boring for me is a lack of a mission statement that says, we're sitting here on £77 million and we will deliver you a Lisbon in, your, in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. but, you know, my dad didn't get to Lisbon because I was on the way. He, he was in Milan, then he was in Seville sitting beside me. He's now passed away. My, my, my challenge to... To, to, to the Celtic hierarchy is if that's not your goal, then what is your goal? Mm. Just add something. Yeah, I suspect they don't have a goal. And you're right, I didn't know how rebellious you want to be about the board and so on, so I was keeping my powder dry yeah. uh, on that. But there's no doubt that there's a lack of ambition uh, at the top in Huge. Celtic. Uh, the biscuit tin board had more ambition. Uh, I knew them really quite well. Uh and uh, for all their faults, uh, they won the European Cup. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> nobody else has. Well, now we can't get out of the group. No. Now we can never get out of the group. Mm -hmm. Whatever group we get, we can't get out of it. Uh, and that's a fundamental uh, failing. And uh, it's I am compelled to say that Neil did get out of the group once. Did it? Yeah, that was yep. uh, the last time we did okay. it, actually. Yeah, last time we did Neil go to the group. It's just, it's just because, you know, I'm <laughs> defending Neil. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> Barcelona. Fair point. Of course, I'll never forget the Barcelona victory. But uh, the the truth is, there'll not be a Lisbon in our lifetime, uh, even young Tommies. Uh, the, 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 the reality is something big would have to shift. We'd have to get uh, some sheik from Arabi. Uh, to come and uh, take us over. Uh, I can maybe help with that. I was uh, going to say, can you make that I, call? I, just I, I can maybe About the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as long as the current ownership on the club, they're they're just content to take over. Uh, Be the big have, dogs in Scotland. Yes. And we have this incredible fan base, uniquely in Scotland, almost new, uniquely in Britain, we have an international fan base. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you if you walk through the streets of Kuala Lumpur at one or two o'clock in the morning, you'll see thousands of Manchester United fans. We can't match that. But we've got people getting up at seven o'clock in the morning to watch Celtic in, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got an American fan base, an Australian fan base. The Everywhere the Irish diaspora is, is our fan base. That is, I mean, you're a businessman, I'm not, but even I could say that's a tradable commodity. See, George, I have on many occasions and, and I've come up with one or two ideas where we can harness the opportunity of the Irish diaspora. Um, and my great friend, a guy called Marty Cramchie, who I, I sent in 2010 to run an operation for me in, in New York, has just been voted the president 
of the Jockster Daily's Los Angeles number one with 300 people who turned up for his first game the other morning. And most of them who have Instagram followers are 10 to 15 million because they star in movies. Yeah. So there's an opportunity here for us to become a 21st century business that harnesses the great, you know, the, 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 the Scottish and the Irish diaspora. But does that for a revenue stream that would allow that to flow into the club more importantly, I'm not expecting to win the Champions League, but I am expecting to win the Europa League in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, 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 that's, that, that should be achievable. That's achievable. Steve, that Stephen, the, the, I suppose it all comes down to the standard. The, George has addressed a, a, a situation that we all have to address, and that is the standard of football that we're playing. Our Scottish League, whether we like it or not, every time the Hearts, the Mullerwolves, are playing in Europe and getting beat with Welsh teams and getting beat with um, teams you've never heard of from Finland and, and Norway, you know, it lowers the standards of the Scottish League. And Celtic, as, as George has said, we could dominate. F mm. The fact that we've won two nines in our, our rows, if you look at the 20th, uh, first century in particular, we've absolutely dominated yeah. the 21st century. Yeah. Um, the worry is taking the step forward. Now, by the way, this show goes out on Friday. Uh -huh. Hopefully, some people will be watching saying, what are you talking about? You're half your head. We won in the Champions they League got on Wednesday, right? Because we've got a home game. And by the way, if we don't win that game, then everything George has said is absolutely spot on. Because if we can only win home games in the Champions League, George, we're never going to advance. And there is a problem about this. Thing. You, George, get brought up in a period... Where the Dundee Uniteds were winning the league, yes. where the, the Hibs were in cup finals, <laughs> where the Aberdeens were dominating. Where are they now? And that standard has fallen. When we were producing oh, yeah. the Martin Buckins, when we were producing the the, the the players that were going to England, the Billy Bremners of the world. There would be five and six Scottish players in top English games. Yeah. My big concern is the next generation of fans who don't think <laughs> Scottish football is that sexy. And they're putting on their YouTube and they're seeing Man City and Man United and all the influencers are telling them these are the, the clubs that are cool, you know? There's an easy solution to this and, and we're, no, we're still in the face. And the board know it. They've been presented with the opportunity. We've, we, we, we're in Dumfries and Galloway. There's a club called Carlisle or Barrow and Furness mm -hmm. or Gateshead. They're all in the English, the, English, um, the English pyramid, as they call it. Why do we not acquire it? Why do we not put money in? Why do we not go through the leagues? And then what do we put to do is when we get to the English Championship? We then put all the guns in to become a Premier League club. By the way, Wrexham are in Wales. You know, Swansea are in Wales. Yeah. God. They play They play in England. Why don't a club of our magnitude, and, and see when they always talk about we have to go with Rangers, leave them here. They're a small club with a fan base that don't have any recognition anywhere near us. Fundamentally, what we do is we have to acquire something and let it progress through the English leagues. Then when it comes to the Championship, we throw the kitchen sink at it. We get into the Premier League and we take a rightful place amongst the biggest clubs in the world. But we have to acquire a club to do that. The board know that, but we're happy sitting in Scotland, dominating. I'm not happy sitting in Scotland. No, no. I want to see us, you know, I don't know George until today, but I'm, I'm sure we'll be pals for a long time because we. I, I see what he's saying. And when you turn on the Premier League, you go, well, we go like, gee, I'm going to tune into this. I, I get it that what we need to do is find a way to get to the promised land. That's the duty of the board to deliver that for the diaspora of Celtic support globally. But I suppose the counter argument to that, Stephen, is that football has got history. Football's got tradition. Celtic's got a very, very rich history and tradition, which, is, which we all love. And I worry that we're pursuing some promised land and giving up that background, that context, that history. Whereas, I mean, FC Copenhagen it made the latter stages of the yeah. Champions League. Yeah. Bayer Leverkusen has turned into a, 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 a championship winning team yeah. in Germany. Yeah. You, you've, you've got teams in Norway um, that are regularly in the latter stages of the Champions League. In other words, what I'm saying, Stephen, is I'm not sure that we need to be in that league to compete in Europe. Brendan, and I'm, I'm a big fan of Brendan's as well, Brendan has said that his challenge this time around is to make his mark in Europe, right? And I think, I mean, 
we've saw some signings now. We've broke the, the piggy bank. Mm -hmm. We yeah. went from, um, was it eight and a half? Then we went to 11. What we've assembled, I think, and I'm good. You know, you hope you're not wrong, George, because it's a Friday and we're saying it's a Wednesday. But what we've assembled, I think, is the strongest pool I've seen for a long time with Glasgow Celtic. The strongest pool. We've not had that in the past. And by the way, there's still two or three short. Yeah. Still yeah. two or three short. Because when it comes to the wings and we're bringing on wingers, mm -hmm. there are question marks over whether Palmer's going to be able to step up to the mark. Yang, I've got, you know, I don't think he's capable of stepping up to the mark. I hope he proved me wrong. So we're still short. But in the middle of the park and at the back now, I think we've got quality. I think we're prepared, which is something we've not been in the past. We're prepared going into our first Champions League game. We've got a team that I think there are areas you could improve on, but they're good enough to play at that level. So there's been other seasons where we've gone into a Champions League campaign and I don't think we're prepared. And you think near Beaton's playing at centre-half and he's not a centre-half. And that happened time and time again, Tommy. Yes. Um, so I totally agree with that. And I, I get the box office and the, the attraction to the, the bright lights of the English Premiership. Personally, I'm going to ask, uh, because George, you've made your, your point clear, I would welcome it personally. Tommy, I'm getting the vibe you would like to stay in Scotland. I, I would like to see the context of the proposal, right? Because um, what I don't want to give up on is Scottish football. Yeah. Scot Scotland as a national team, and we, we support it as a national team. We used to produce world-class... Danny McGreen, for me, was a world-class fullback. And you you had in, in, in the shape of uh, Willie Miller um, and, and, and McLeish when they were playing at the back for Scotland. You never thought you were going to lose. Gordon McQueen, what a centre-half. Kenny Dalglish, what a forward. Joe Jordan, why are we not producing these guys any longer? You know, that, that there's a fundamental question there, George, isn't there? But there is. What, what is wrong at the grassroots that we're not and, producing and, them? And what it isn't, uh, my father was, God rest him, was a, a, a kind of traditional or classical social democrat. And he always argued that uh, our people were too well off now to continue uh, to develop football in the way that we did in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. That's fundamentally untrue. First of all, we're not very well off now. Uh, and secondly, countries that are much better off than us are still producing yeah. uh, top uh, players. Norway is uh, a much richer country than us. The Netherlands, much richer country than us. And look at their national teams. Look at the club achievements of these uh, countries. So it isn't only about that. What it is about, I'm damned if I know. I've got a boy in the in the kids' football uh, league now. He's 10 years old. He's a fantastic uh, player. People turn up to watch him. Uh, but will he, will he make it from... Uh, from the Scottish uh, kids game into the professional league? I'm not at all sure of that. I mean, he's playing without a referee for a start. Mm -hmm. My other two boys play in Manchester. They've got a referee in every game. They play offside. They take throw-ins, not kick-ins. Yep. Uh, and they've got a league. I mean, my boy's now in the league from this uh, season, but in uh, previous years. No league. We're one of these, you know, uh, it's not the winning that counts. It's a taking part. <laughs> all that, no, it's just all that. Nonsense. That sounds like the chairman's statement yesterday, Stephen. Yeah. I, but we're by the way, I've got to come away to this about what you <laughs> said in the car. And I think you, and, and we, we should challenge uh, Mr. Lowell in this over to your good self. Well, I, I always read the chairman's statement with interest because I know every word is, is edited to the nth degree. And when he was talking about Europe, he was speaking about participation in Europe. Mm -hmm. And as a Celtic fan, I've not seen a great deal of European um, success. But I think we should be competing, not participating. And that, I found that was just the big yeah. takeaway yeah. from yesterday. Yeah. I, I, I was there in Lisbon. I was there in Milan. Uh, Seville created a tsunami of change in my life because I never missed anything home and away. And it, it led me down a garden path that I'll tell you about a little later on. However, much more important, much more importantly, it gave me the greatest joy that 
I I can't even watch it to this day. And I was in um, I was in the company of the great Messiah Mark McNeil uh, down in a place called Eden Rock Cap Deal on Teep once in one of my honeymoons. And uh, and he what said <laughs> what, and he said to me, which I thought was which I thought was great, I can't watch it either. But that was the night after Maraboa, should we say, put them to the sword and we, we had a glass or two of Whispering Angel that day. And but Mark Neil gave us belief again mm -hmm. yes, on, that, sure. on, on that on that on that run. Yeah. And and I was holding away with, with with every single game, and uh, the guy who was the chairman of the business that was chief executive at the time. Said, I, I, "Are you finished? Now? Can you come back to work?" And I went, "I'm not sure I can come back for a couple of weeks because I'm dealing with the fact that I never thought we could beat." And when we did get beat that night, I actually thought, "You know what? That's where I coined the phrase I was been in a lifetime." And I just want to be there to see Celtic winning a European trophy. Whatever guys that is, before I go somewhere else, and that would probably be the thing that drives me more in life if I was the chief executive of Celtic. Yeah, and yet, ironically, well Stephen, with the new setup, with the new European setup, that chance of a European trophy is probably less. So we don't try to the Europa League anymore, but do we? The point. That's, that's the point. You know, we yeah. used to say, "Listen, don't worry, yeah, whatever. We'll it. compete in the Champions exactly. League as long as we." Finish third out the four, Aye. we'll drop into the UEFA League and we've got a better chance because we're really a UEFA well, team. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll Scotland, drop out now, Tommy, hopefully Scotland's coefficient means we might not get into the Champions League well, next year. They're into well. the and, you know, the, the issue is that the financial and economic situation getting into the Champions League is a huge hurdle when, you know, Canal Plus or, or, or uh, the, the La Liga have given Barcelona and Real Madrid huge amounts of money. Not even anywhere competing with the fact that Brentford get 132 million quid and we get two and a half. Mm -hmm. the, 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 there are economics here that want, that, that drives my thinking to drive towards the Premier League or somewhere in the higher echelons of the Premier League so that we have the financial capability to actually compete. Uh, uh, to to me, yeah. it's... Uh... I mean, I know Tommy's got a sentimental point of view, uh, and I, I feel it, I understand it, but I think we're not going to have the glory that I experienced if we stay in the current situation. And, uh, you know, I'm getting on. I, I want to experience that joy again. Uh, and I want my, certainly want my children to experience it. I mean, I, I, I send my boys... Uh, clips from not just from uh, Lisbon, but also from Seville, because I want to I want to remind them, mm -hmm. uh, because I often feel, especially over the last couple of years, where uh, Manchester United have been in the doldrums, uh, my boys must hate me for bringing them up as Celtic supporters <laughs> and Manchester United <laughs> supporters, and I'm consciously sending them clips, but they're all old clips mm -hmm. now. Yep, uh, and uh, George keeps wants mentioning about. The age and being old, you must tell the stories. <laughs> you must tell the story about when you realise it was time we passed the torch. I passed the I, I, I passed the torch on to Tommy. <laughs> he dropped it a few times. <laughs> I passed the torch on to him oh, when we were both being arrested uh, at Faz Lane protesting against nuclear weapons. <laughs> Tommy and I simultaneously arrested by a dozen of Strathclyde's finest officers. Uh, one of them said, I'll get Tommy, you get the Aldean. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. I so well done. <laughs> I'm I wasn't even 60 there. I was, I was only 50 odd. <laughs> <laughs> I love that I love story. You, the you get the Aldean. I, I know that story. story. I know that story. You need to let me tell this time in George because <laughs> you, you may remember it uh, differently but I hope you remember it the way I remember it. And it was, uh, I was invited on to the Big Brother house and I needed some advice about the Big Brother house. And George gratefully uh, agreed to share a breakfast with me at Mark Hall. That's right. They were in uh, uh, as a Lanark uh, Lancashire or Lanarkshire the night yeah. before. So we met in the morning <laughs> and George told me, he says, Tommy, he says, you need to try and remember, it's a game show. It's a game show. He said, you need to try and remember. He said, I, when I was invited in, he said, I had grand plans. I was going to write my new book. I was going to read my new, he said, I knew I had no pen or paper, but I was going to write it up here. I was going to use the time productively and write a new book. He says, by the second day, all I wanted to know 
and who stole the fucking hobnobs? <laughs> <laughs> Where did, he get, where, did he, where did he get that tobacco? He didn't have a cigarette. It, it was such a lesson, John, because, it did, it? well, the point is, I was, because I was forewarned and because you had given me that advice, I felt much better at just smiling and laughing at what was going on rather than becoming embroiled in the, the pettiness of it all. Because, you know, the tear mount with the, the addition I was in, I mean, it was tear after tear after tear, and it was tantrum after tantrum. Yeah. Yeah. But your advice had helped me realise it was a bit like, I think it's Brian Conley or whatever, who's the one that says, it's a puppet! <laughs> well, I kept thinking to myself, it's a game show! Yeah. So <laughs> Boys, you think you've got another arrest in you? Uh, well, we're hoping not. Uh, because uh, you get arrested for what you think now. Uh, never mind what you say. Definitely. And uh, you don't even have to do anything. And some of our best friends have ended up in the clink for thought crimes. Uh, so it's, uh, it's taken... I mean, the, we were thrown into Greenock Jail, Tommy and me, that day. <laughs> Uh, I'll forget it. We weren't that long. Brian Dempsey, Brian Dempsey, uh, the man who helped save Celtic, he he uh, talked several times to the governor, uh, and uh, he said, uh, "Finally, they let me out late at night." Brian sent a, a Rolls Royce, uh, honestly, a Rolls Royce to pick me up outside the jail, and uh, he booked me into the Hilton. Uh, but in that Rolls Royce, at the time I smoked cigars, in the in that Rolls Royce, imagine smoking in a car in a Rolls Royce. <laughs> there was like a mug with a lovely Monte Cristo number two in it, already <laughs> chopped with a box of matches right next to it. God, God bless Brian Dempsey. But uh, we were thrown into this smelly jail, but we we never felt that anything worse was going to happen to us. You know, we were legitimately protesting. Uh, the cops were doing their job. They didn't hate us or anything. I'm not sure that that's the case now, no. mm -hmm. that uh, the new generation uh, of, uh, of, of people like us, they're in, you know, Richard Medhurst, for example, Paul of ours was, he was actually handcuffed coming off a plane and held under, uh, I think, Section 5 rather than 12, which meant he wasn't allowed a lawyer wasn't allowed to tell anyone where he was. He was incommunicado uh, for a, a long time. Mm -hmm. It's taken a sinister turn is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, whether we have another arrest in us, uh, I'm hoping not. <laughs> Tommy, what cast <laughs> came to pick you up that night? That was. <laughs> that wasn't a Rolls Royce. Tommy, did you get the bus? So he shot me. Did you get the bus? Jobs, um, to be fair to him, he's always said that uh, a taste for the finer things in life. And I've always, always said, and George agrees, there's nothing too good for the working class. Exactly. And, that, and that's the attitude we should Absolutely. always have because the workers built all of the beauty exactly. in the planet, and exactly. we should never, ever uh, forget that. William McIlvany, God rest him, I, I once turned up at a miners' demonstration in Edinburgh with a, I can't remember what now, but it was a kind of designer bag, and Willie, paraphrasing General Booth of uh, the Salvation Army, Willie said, why should the devil have all the best suits? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Really good. Do you know, there's, a, there's, there's another quote of, of Willie's, um, George, which came to mind when we had the anti-racism yeah. rally just a couple of weeks ago in Glasgow when the fascists were supposed to be turning up and, to, and telling immigrants they weren't welcome. And Wally used to coin the phrase, he said, Scotland is a mongrel nation, a mongrel nation. You know, because we are a collection of immigrants. We had this discussion yeah. with Rudy Vata, um, <laughs> that, that we, as a club, were built by immigrants. And we should never forget that. Any, any hint, I've seen when I see any racist comments on a, a Twitter feed or on a Facebook post, and I look and see a Celtic flag associated with that person. I think to myself, you don't know anything about your history. You, I think it's you fake. You don't know anything about your history. I think it's yeah. fake. Yeah. Well, I, I said to a guy who, unfortunately, was not fake, but he was live on a, I do a show where there's a video wall and people phone in and they're on screen. Uh, and this broad Irish accent yes. spewing the most filthy sentiments. And uh, I said to him, you know, Our Lady weeps when she hears 
an Irish accent speaking words like you are speaking. And I feel that, yes. that uh, given our history, for these kind of racist, even fascistic idea, and it's quite heavy now in Ireland, uh, there's a lot of these people. We mustn't uh, idealize uh, Ireland as a place where such people don't exist. They do. And uh, I had one of them on my show. Uh, it was quite sobering. Very sad. I've heard you getting the better of people um, on your old radio show. I think it was Talk Sport. You, mm -hmm. you like to, you know, knock people off their peg a, a few times there, George. Was it easy for you to communicate with them? Or are, are they properly uh, brainwashed almost to the degree of fascism, like you say, right Well, one? sometimes I may have gone too far, especially in the Talk Sport days. Because, of course, at the end of the day, you're going to have to win people like that over, mm -hmm. not just batter them into submission. Uh, but uh, in me and Tommy's tradition, we prefer to batter them into submission. <laughs> but it's not actually necessarily the right way. Uh, but uh, the Talk Sport show was a 10 p.m. kickoff. So the callers had had a few. Um, by one o'clock in the morning, they'd had more than a few. <laughs> so uh, there was some real, unfortunately, talk sport have wiped off from YouTube most of the, not all, but most of the classic encounters. <laughs> the classic uh, encounters. I don't know if, you're, uh, if your audience remembers the bomb <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. uh, it's for a radio clip, it's got 100 million views. Wow. 100 million views for a radio clip. No pictures. Mm -hmm. Just a guy phoning up. We need a bomb or a lot of them, bomb or a lot of them, bomb or a lot of them. And then I say, Are you a Rangers man, Jimmy? <laughs> how did you how did you know that? <laughs> I said, bomb. The whole country knew it before you said it. Uh, but uh, uh, so I mean yeah, I mean I'd I was a bit Mike Tyson with uh, some of them when perhaps a bit of Muhammad Ali would have been better. You mean intellectual savagery? Yes. It's intellectual, wonderful. Intellectual savagery. <laughs> Tony was talking about the, you know, enjoying the finer things in life. Did you ever enjoy a cigar with Fidel Castro? Many times. Uh, I had the great honour of knowing Fidel very well. I uh, spent hundreds of hours in his uh, company, but... I've got to break the bad news to you that Fidel stopped smoking in 1979 and constantly upbraided me for smoking. And when, you remember, I went to the U.S. Senate in, uh, in 2005 uh, and had something of a triumph, and I appeared on CNN uh, uh, in the Capitol building, which was a no-smoking building, and I lit up a Cuban cigar which, of course, was breaking the uh, blockade <laughs> and smoked it live on CNN. Now, Fidel always watches, watched uh, CNN, but always the big screen in his private quarters, always on CNN. And so when I got back to Britain, the Cuban ambassador asked if uh, she could call uh, around with a message from the commander, the commandante, I said, of course, I was expecting congratulations for well, how well, how well I'd done in the Senate. He said, his message was, you promised me 12 years ago that you had stopped smoking. And I've just watched it on CNN, lighting up a Cuban cigar. No, he always argued that uh, we don't need you as a customer, we need you as a, a combatant. So stop the smoking, it's very bad for you. Which I did now 10 years ago and... Now I'm addicted to uh, nicotine gum. <laughs> if you'll forgive me, I'm going to, oh, well, going to chew one. Well, 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 to well chew George one. is chewing his nicotine gum. <laughs> Can I also, you remember this uh, story, uh, George, because you were so friendly with Fidel. One of the other things that uh, one of Fidel's edicts, as well as the smoking, and it was all health related, because yeah. Cuba is Very the place. world leader in the promotion of health, preventative health measures is what Cuba specialises in. And I love them for it. They're way ahead of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But Fidel also, at one of the central committee meetings in the early 80s, had declared that all speeches from now on should be shorter. <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading one of the reports that, that, that talked about all species be sure that and Fidel had spoken for two and a half hours on this. <laughs> <laughs> but what a, it's, it, 
what an inspiration. I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I never had a chance to, to, to meet uh, Fidel. I, I did meet Chavez um, and I did meet Jose Vicente Rangel, the vice mm. president uh, in Venezuela. Um, and that was a great pleasure. But I was always jealous of you. Uh, well, I was in a meeting with Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro. Yeah, see that? He's just, <laughs> he's just rubbing in. He's just rubbing in. No. But uh, uh, I was on what turned out to be, sadly, uh, Fidel's last uh, live television show. It was called Redondo. It was a round table and it consisted of Fidel Castro, me, and a series of sometimes hapless Cuban officials who came on <laughs> to get slapped about uh, for their uh, failures. <laughs> And this, uh, uh, for example, the head of the bank, the central bank, came on and he gave. Uh, Fidel was a great man for what he called the exactitude. So he didn't want to hear broad brush terms. He wanted exact numbers, exact times, table, timetables, etc. So the, the, the hapless manager of the bank said, no, over 900 million. I said, what do you mean over 900 million? 999 million or 991? Uh, 901 uh, million. Give me the exact phone that I didn't have. Oh. And uh, it's like when he asked me, he, once he asked me, uh, what's the total tonnage of North Sea oil? <laughs> I couldn't have told you to the nearest. A million. I had no idea about oil, barrels, tonnage. And he looked at me as if to say, you sure you're a Brit? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're on Redondo. And it lasted live from 5 p.m. till after midnight. Wow. And it only finished because the Rostam cameraman fell asleep and fell <laughs> off his chair to the ground with a thud live on TV. And Fidel said, I think that's a sign. <laughs> and I said to him afterwards, there's nobody have going to have watched that for seven hours. He said, you tell me the reaction in the streets of Havana tomorrow, whether they watched or not. Sure enough, every person that I went was, that's him for last night. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Redondo. Uh, but right after that, he <coughs> he became uh, ill and uh, sadly passed uh, some years later, but he, he didn't do any more live uh, TV debate. So I was on his, his last one. You were talking there about 100 million views on your radio clip, Taking yeah. Down the Rangers fan. Yeah. Um, your US Senate appearance probably had a few more views than that. Yeah. George, what I've always wondered when I've watched that is, you know, nerves can get the better of you in any walk of your life. You could be appearing at court and you fluff your lines and all the rest of it. That that looked almost like an out-of-body experience watching that. Is it because you were talk telling the truth? Is that yeah. is that what it well, was? Well, you've taken the words out of my mouth. I think Tommy and I were, are both uh, two of a kind in that we are... Uh, working class people, uh, they they misunderestimated me, uh, but neither of us gets nervous. Uh, you, you're, you're only nervous if you're going to tell a lie. If you are going to tell the truth, then you're thankful for the opportunity to tell it mm -hmm. uh, in front of all these cameras, in front of uh, that big an audience and so on. So for me, uh, it was a great opportunity. It wasn't a challenge or a threat or... A lot of people said to me, don't go, they'll put you in an orange jumpsuit, take it to Guantanamo. Uh, I said, no, no, I'm going, I insist on going. Uh, and, uh, I mean, obviously, one doesn't perform as well every single time that one performs. And undoubtedly, I had wings that day, uh, but it was because of the occasion that I had the, the wings. I knew it was a cup final. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a European mm -hmm. Cup final. It was a World, World Cup final, yes. and uh, and I was determined to uh, a triumph. But uh, I, I I said the the, the chairman of it, Norman uh, Crikey, I forgot his name, but he was a senator at the time. He's now the chief lobbyist for Saudi Arabia uh, in Washington. But uh, he he tried to bully me a bit before the show uh, with some procedural points, you know, like, you know, you're all out make an opening statement. That's, I said, don't make the mistake of imagining that I'm afraid of you. Good. I'm afraid only of God, not of you. And he was kind of took aback by that. And the rest, plain sailing. I kind of felt that I'd 
got in about his ribs right at, really, at the beginning. Did you leave it in back? No, I mean, I could have spoken for I, hours. I saw that. Uh, because I knew everything about Iraq. I mean, there's lots of things I know very little about and some things I know absolutely nothing about. But about Iraq, I knew absolutely everything. There was nothing that they could surprise me with, nothing they could blindside me with. Blindside me with I uh, I was going in there brim full of indignation, but also of facts. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was a good day. I yeah. was meant to ask you, George, in terms of your opening statement, whether you had borrowed on the McCarthy witch hunt. Yeah, because the way you started was I have I am not now nor have I ever been an oil trader. And and I thought well, myself, I wonder if you you, McCarthy, you, know? you picked it up from you. Yeah? yeah, absolutely. I, I I also because I was once a boxer, uh, I think in boxing metaphors quite often. I've even done it in this show uh, tonight, talking about Ali Tyson and so on. I decided on when I decided on my approach. Do I go in like Tyson? Do I dance around like Ali? I decided on Rocky Marciano, whose style was simply remorseless jabs, remorseless punching, never ceasing. The opponent knows there's another jab after this one. This was the Marciano style. And I, I, I consciously adopted that. Because uh, I could have gone in, both Tom and I can do the Tyson. Uh, we can also do a bit of Ali, but I felt this was the, because I knew it was going to be a long gig, uh, and it wasn't going to be over in one round, mm -hmm. two rounds, so I was going to go the distance, so the Marciano approach was the one that I uh, took. But that's the only conscious preparation that I made. Uh, I, all the words just came to me. And how, how you, you, you just rums fell was brilliant. You know, okay. I've met Saddam the same number of times as you, only difference is you were there to sell them arms. I mean, sell them guns, so gas, and the uh, maps with which to yeah. target them. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. It was a good uh, for a for a council house take. It, but you see that, but George, to me, to me, that's why they hate you so much. Why the establishment hates you so much. It's why I've always been proud to de defend George. As I say, we, you know, ninety nine percent of things George and I will, will agree on. We disagree on, on this or that, but it's never stopped as being friends and no. defending each other. No. But I am very proud to be associated with George because of his working class background, because of what he's achieved against all the odds. And that's why the establishment hates you so much. In my opinion, that's why they hate you. Our pal, Big Bob Wiley, yeah. Ranger supporter, yeah. a good friend of ours, uh, our pal, Big Bob, said they hate you because they know that you really mean it. You're getting it, yeah. Yep. They can't buy you, Joe. Can they can't buy you. Can I, can I ask you a question about, um, in terms of yourself and, and Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. um, being lone voices for mm -hmm. the Irish Republican struggle mm -hmm. and, and how difficult that was. And, and, and see me growing up um, in, in, in hunger cycles and, and, and actually adopting the fact that I am an Irish Republican mm -hmm. and how then I had to become an entrepreneur. Because mm -hmm. nobody else would hire me because yeah, of that. That's not very good. And, and, and I quite like that. Yeah. Uh, but more importantly, you, you, you remember a parliament at the time and, and yourself and, and, and Jeremy stand up and, and, and talk to Martin and Jerry. How difficult was that in order to put the hand of friendship out to listen to what they were really going through? It was pretty difficult. Uh, but, you know, here I stand. I can do no other. Uh, I grew up on, on Irish Republicanism, James Connolly being shot in his chair and all that. Uh, so when I became a member of parliament, very quickly, uh, Jeanette Finlay, who's in the news at the moment, yeah. sent me uh, on an errand to Dublin uh, to stand on the back of a truck with Martin McGuinness, Jerry Adams, and the late Sinead O'Connor, uh, who sang I Wish I Was Back Home in Derry. Uh, it was uh, quite a remarkable. And I, I became friendly with her after that. And uh, uh, the son ran my picture with, uh, I would say, something like a 42-point bold headline, One War Traitor. And they started a fund to prosecute me, which they did twice, actually. They did the same thing in the Iraq war, a fund to privately prosecute me 
uh, for uh, incitement to disaffection. And I remember saying, put that on my gravestone. He incited <laughs> up to disaffection. But uh, it was uh, quite difficult because, of course, the the military, uh, the armed struggle was uh, still happening uh, at that time. Um, and uh, it was, it's always harder. It's always easier. I remember somebody wrote a song about it, a really good one. Uh, How come all the British lefties uh, love the revolution in Nicaragua? Uh, but they've got nothing to say about Ireland. Ireland. <laughs> exactly. And the answer is, you know, bothering them, if you're supporting the revolutionaries in Nicaragua, you're definitely bothering them if you are supporting the struggle in Ireland. So, yeah, it was uh, difficult, and uh, it's to Jeremy Corbyn's eternal credit that he never wavered uh, on that issue uh, at all. And now, I mean, when I went to Mr. Ben's funeral, uh, sat in front of me were Tony Blair... Oh, Mrs. Blair, Jeez. Jerry Adams, and Martin McGuinness, and the same few. Uh, whereas I was a traitor for speaking on the back of a lorry uh, with them in 1990. I remember my first surgery back, uh, one of my constituents, Pest actually, was in every week, couldn't be satisfied. He said, so how, how head? Uh, uh, yeah, he <laughs> said to me, in the party of Borough Halls, he said to me, are you tired of being an MP or what? <laughs> Uh, because he thought that doing this in 1990 would ensure my defeat in the next election. Funnily enough, on the eve of the next election, I don't think I've ever told this story before, uh, I go, uh, so the eve of poll, 1992, I get woken up by my comrades who tell me that in the middle of the night, thousands of sticky-backed posters, green on white, Galloway, IRA, have gone up all over the constituency. And we've got people now up on ladders and standing on top of railings and so on, trying to get them off. Uh, everybody was quite worried uh, because the traitor thing from 1990 was still an issue. Uh, so I go to Celtic Park on the Saturday, so two days after I've been re-elected, uh, to hand out leaflets for the Scotland United rally that we were going to hold in George Square the yep. next day. So, of course, I'm there, so I go in. And in the jungle are four of these posters bobbing around <laughs> in the crowd. <laughs> got away, I, I, I never felt more proud, I must say. I've never told that story on the audio for as well. I mean, I, I think by, obviously, we, we can touch on your feelings now about a, a Labour party that you gave so much to, George. You know, you think about over, what was it, 36 years? 37. 37 years and what it has become and how disappointed you must be in that. But if you go right back to when you were a lot younger in Dundee and your hands are covered in ink and you're doing some uh, flyer printing, somebody chaps the door and he comes in, it's a student um, and he's Palestinian and he starts talking to you. And that's, that's set off, when was that, 1975? Uh, yes. Yeah, and that set off something yeah. in your mind mm -hmm. that I think everybody sitting here today would absolutely agree with you on, mm -hmm. and that is the, the resistance, the yeah. fight of the Palestinians. Yeah. It changed my life, actually, that visit. Uh, not that I wouldn't have been a supporter of the Palestinians. Obviously, I would have. They, we had a world view, uh, and that the Palestinians were in that world view. Uh, I had a big map on my wall with little red pins uh, in our countries and uh, yellow pins for countries that were in play, like uh, like Portugal at that time. Mm -hmm. Was it going to go one way or the other? Uh, and Palestine was part of that worldview. So I had already been a supporter of the cause and would have continued uh, being so, but I would not have, in a way, had it dominate my life to the extent that it has if not for that man coming through that door uh, that day. Uh, he spoke so mesmerizingly about what had happened to the Palestinians that by the time he left, I was fully signed up uh, to the revolution. But crucially, he arranged for me to go to Lebanon in 1977 uh, and meet the leaders of the PLO. 
uh, principally President Arafat, German Arafat as he was then. Uh, and he took a liking to me. So I, 1977, I was 23. Uh, and he became like a, another father uh, to me. And he asked me to stick around when the others left. Uh, Ron Mackay was there. Right. Uh, they left after a week. I stayed many months after that. Um, I, uh, I, I became firm friends with him living in the PLO compound in the Fakani district of Beirut. And that's what, if you like, changed my life because such an intensive absorption in a cause and the making of more than friends, yeah? I mean, brothers, uh, you can never let them down. So, I mean, I would actually have stayed there. Maybe some people watching wished I had, but <laughs> I would have stayed there, uh, but he... Uh, told me I had to go back. Uh, he said, why do we need you here? We've got plenty of people here. Uh, we need you in Britain advocating for us. And on the final night when I was saying goodbye to him, I, I made a promise that I, the exact words were, I will never leave the Palestinian people alone. And that's a promise that I've kept. You know, how proud are you then when you see Celtic Park with the Palestinian flags. And you're looking at that because it would be easy to, to set Celtic aside as a fan base. And some of the words we've heard since I've went to see Celtic in the, the 80s, you know, lovers of terrorism and all this kind of stuff. And that's a, that is a title, George, that has been labelled on the Palestinian mechanism of defence, some would say a resistance. Yeah. Um, but Celtic fans did it anyway, knowing they would get any trouble. Yeah, uh... There are no words that I can fully uh, express how I feel about that. Uh, it engenders a swell of emotion in me. My heart almost bursts, even talking to you now about it. Uh, my heart almost bursts with love and joy and pride uh, every time I see it. And how many times have we seen it? And then when it's captured nowadays on social media in clips that go around the world. And I see the response from people that think like us on that subject, how they love Celtic for this, uh, how, uh, how proud I am therefore to be a Celtic supporter. I've, I've said words, but there are not really adequate words to describe how I uh, feel about it and how the Palestinians feel about it. As you can imagine, after 50 years in that cause, I know rather a few Palestinians, and all of them know about the support of the famous Glasgow Celtic for uh, their cause. Every one of them knows. The child in a refugee camp knows. A child in Gaza under bombardment knows that somewhere in a place called Glasgow, there are thousands of people singing for them, waving their flag, when it seems that all the Western world is against them. That's not a small thing, you know. It's Celtic has, Celtic supporters have written their name in the stars with the stand that they've made for Palestine. And it's a joy, a joy to behold. I'm nearly green here, so we're starting. No, you don't. No. Thanks for no. no. Magical no. Yeah. We're probably moving towards the end of our, our, our show anyway, but when we witnessed the Celtic fans showing the banners, stay silent when children are sleeping, mm -hmm. not no. when they're being slaughtered. Exactly. I mean, that to me summed up the humanity, which is at the very, very root, the human solidarity that yeah. exists within the DNA or should exist yeah. within the DNA yeah. of Celtic supporters. And, and, I just wish it comes from our background, yeah. right? I mean, the other people don't do it because they don't have our yes. background. Exactly. Uh, we were starved. We were subjected to what they call a famine, but was in fact a genocidal act. So, uh, we were uprooted. We had to scatter around the world as, uh, as refugees and immigrants. Uh, we faced the empire uh, at its pomp. We were the first to defeat the empire before anyone else. 
Thank you for inviting it's us. It's been a pleasure, actually. And I've for loved talking it. to us about all things I thought you were going to ask me who, who the greatest player was. I was going to... But you did it. I've got quite... I've got... Uh, for someone my age, I've got quite a controversial uh, view so, some, on it. Some rings a bell in my mind that you were a fan of Neely Malkin. Uh, well, Neely was a great, great performer and much underrated. And I saw him in a Celtic jersey and a Dundee United mm -hmm. uh, jersey. But no, uh, for someone my age... They'd have to pick one of the Lions, but I don't, right? The greatest player I ever saw in a Celtic jersey was Henrik Larsson. Oh. I think that Henrik Larsson was the complete footballer, mm -hmm. and he went on to prove it even after he left us. But the joy that Henrik Larsson gave me was great, maybe because I was a grown man by then, not a boy, but it was greater than any other player has given me, and there have been scores of great players that I have thrilled to. But Henrik Larsson bearing in on goal, Henrik Larsson in a flying header, Henrik Larsson with his, uh, his uh, braids flowing behind them in full tilt was such a joy to behold. And when the fans used to sing, oh, won't you stay just a little bit longer, I shed a tear. Grown man weeps. And when I saw him in the last game, out on the park with his family. Oh, man. Unforgettable. Emotions. Unforgettable. And I later got to see him in both the Barcelona and the Manchester United top. Uh, and he was, he was still brilliant, even though we thought he was going off into a term. Uh, he was the best signing we ever made, in my opinion. Fantastic, George. Well, thank you for inviting us into your home. Welcome. For talking all things Celtic and politics, it's an absolute pleasure. I've loved it actually. Enjoyed it. It's Bob. the most well, enjoyable always, interview I've done always, in a long time. Magic. Good to see him. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us once again on a Celtic state of mind. Come back and join us again next Friday at six o'clock for this is Axel.